You guys know what time it is. We straight gas and cutting straight to the bricks. I'm on 12 Vicodins smoking on Scooby Doo Dick. Top shelf Zaza. My shooter, a crackhead. He looked like Woody Harrelson. Reach for my neck, you'll get turned into an example. If I had a dollar for every time they said I gave a shit, I'd be broke, cause I don't give a shit. This shit ain't nothing to me, man. Haters and shambles. Caught a broke boy trying to come up on my Amazon package, so I skinned his ass alive. Ah! They needed a stealth soldier, so I put my hands on the hibachi hot plate at Benihana. I'm not loyal to anybody. I'm a demon. I have no loyalty for anyone. Never did, never will. Shirtless in a loincloth blowing bareback asshole out smoking aqueduct filtered sherm. Call that pussy the matrix, cause I'm in this bitch and I can't get out. I have seen the Magna Carta. I have seen the eye of horror. I was flipping bricks for Monza Musa before y'all even became a type one civilization. This shit ain't nothing to me, you stupid piece of shit. Step the wrong way and you will perish. That pussy feel like Biscoff butter. Hey there, party people. It's your boy Archlich, but you can just call me Archie. And today we're talking about the infamous Sucky Boys. The demon hours predators of the night. The bad boys that you can definitely fix who aren't soulless abominations. We're talking about vampires. No, we're not no. talking about the pussified no. contemporary version of no. vampires that some people have come to know and love, but rather actual, evil, scary vampires. Now vampires have a long and rich history, not only in fantasy, but also folklore and mythology where they find their roots. Most of their inspiration in the game is taken from the European folklore surrounding vampires. Some good examples of these types of creatures would be Dracula and the Strigoi you hear about from Romanian folklore. However, Eastern European vampires of the rather underwhelming realm of Earth are not just a monolith for vampires, and there are other interpretations of these creatures, such as the Xiangxi from China in the East. These are all good inspirations to draw off of when it comes to creating vampires for our games, and giving them more flavor will go a long way towards making them much more interesting characters when compared to the rather underwhelming stat block we see in the Monster <laughs> Manual. Vampires are iconic creatures and not just D&D, but folklore and even in pop culture itself. Considering the status of their influence and pedigree, I think that they are very much due the proper respect they deserve in order to have them live up to the deliciously sinister reputation that they've garnered over time. While I do enjoy running vampires, I never really get to run them enough in my games, and I've always been toying around with the idea of running a vampire hunter game, where my players run around as a group of professional vampire hunters, but alas, it has yet to come to pass. So personally, I think I'm going to enjoy this foray into vampires as an excuse to explore some of the material and to come up with some good ideas to use in my games going forward for these legendary creatures. Anyhow, I believe that's enough of my initial ramblings. It's time to talk about the biggest suckers in the setting. So without further ado, let's get into it. According to my research, vampires were first introduced to D&D in the Dungeons and Dragons White Box in 1974, and they had pretty much all of the stereotypical trappings one would come to expect in a vampire. Comparing this to what we see in the current edition shows that what we see is mostly the same, at least in concept, although I don't know too many of the particulars of the vampires in the first edition D&D from first-hand knowledge, mind you. But what about running these creatures in the current edition? How should that look? Well, I think that a good place to start before anything else when writing a vampire is their mindset and how they work. It's important to understand that a vampire is an undead mockery of what it means to be a living being. While they appear to be human, or whatever their racial equivalent might be in the fantasy setting, they are very much not. Just like their physical forms are a twisted corruption of what they were in life, so are their souls due to the nature of the curse put upon them. Generally in my book, there are very few exceptions to this, and those would only be the pure of heart who returned against their will, and even then, they'll struggle against the curse put upon them. 
After all, in our setting at least, a strong enough cleric can just kill you and resurrect you according to the book, so staying this way is mainly a choice in most cases, which I think can be leaned into very hard when writing. Keeping this in mind, it is easy to see that any powerful vampires that we're going to be writing about are going to be defined by some sort of dark decision or tragedy that motivates them to carry on this way. It would behoove any DM writing one of these characters to consider carefully how these characters came to be the twisted monsters that they are. I would suggest asking yourselves these questions when you're writing these creatures. Who were they in life before unlife? How did they become a vampire? Why did they become a vampire? Why are they still a vampire? What did they want and value in life? And how has that been twisted in their undeath? While this little list isn't exhaustive by any means, I think it's a good start to have a foundation of who your vampire really is, and this is important because it is the motives, thoughts, and desires of vampires that are going to give your vampires believability. And these are all going to be defined by their personalities and their origins. Speaking of writing, vampires are, without a doubt, one of the most social of the undead creatures. While it isn't often the easiest thing to conceal as a game master from your players without practice in direct encounters, we see that vampires are often written as creatures masquerading as humans in order to survive and thrive in the environments that we find them in. Some traditional tropes to feed off of would be lords, a la Count Dracula, who rule over remote municipalities in some dingy, depressing region, Perhaps influential merchants or spellcasters that were too stupid to become a lich. Regardless, they often perform their role best as someone of a reclusive yet influential bent. Think like Bruce Wayne in the newest Batman movie, except a reclusive cannibal instead of a secret furry. When written like this, it allows for them to have multiple proxies that can manage the day-to-day -day and do the things in their stead that they cannot. I still think it's best to refrain from introducing them to players directly as much as you can and having proxies that handle most of the work. It's also important to have them not doing a ton of suspicious things that would get every paladin on the continent getting a god boner for them immediately. It's important to consider that there are many, many ways to reliably detect undead creatures in Dungeons and & Dragons, and it would be wise to consider such things as a wise vampire would likely do the same. The vampire wouldn't take an audience with most people unless absolutely necessary. After all, a single paladin could just randomly fire off Divine Sense and ruin everything in an instant, so it's important to think of how the vampire would likely handle such things. So, let's assume that our vampire is going to be a minor lord of some small county somewhere, and let's think about how they might do things considering what we've thought about. Firstly, I'm going to establish that I'm working off of the assumption that this vampire isn't completely insane, isn't working for some scarier higher entity, and is mainly concerned with trying to survive. Any other eccentricities would be the issues that it would seek to conceal so that it isn't brought into the light, both metaphorically and then quite physically, which I'll leave up to you to write. With that in mind, it would actually be in the vampire's best interest to try and run a stable and functional municipality. While life may not be the most prosperous, the people should be content, and it should be business as usual on any given day. Anything other than this could cause issues that would likely cast scrutiny on them and their activities. This isn't to say that they aren't doing cruel things, but they would be very wise to not be obvious about it. They will also, without a doubt, have a series of people working underneath them to facilitate these things. Think of people like house stewards, constables, tax collectors, jailers, military leaders, diplomats, mayors, and what have you. Most of these people would have no idea that the Lord is a vampire and would likely just be doing their job day in and day out. These personnel would be crucial to the vampire's affairs, as it would need to be resting during the day and couldn't handle most of the business a lord would need to do without obviously being a creature of the night. Another thing worth thinking about during your writing is explaining the vampire's reclusiveness. Rather than just being locked up at its castle all the time, maybe it's garnered a reputation for being a lord of multiple municipalities and it's often traveling to other places either for pleasure or for business, be it real or fabricated in this regard. These little excuses can go a long way to keeping suspicion off of King Vamp while the party handles other business in the region. I found it's better to write them passively and remove them in this way so that the players can have been in this municipality multiple times helping with problems or just passing through. This allows the place to feel familiar so that they aren't immediately vibe-checking anything and everything that moves. Comfort and familiarity is key to keep players off of the trail. There's a couple of different ways that they may get their blood fix. 
The most direct and easy way would be sucking off prisoners that have been sentenced to execution or other disenfranchised peoples whose stories are not likely to be believed. Be careful when selecting this though, because just selecting random poor people wouldn't be subtle at all when the players and most churches that likely have something akin to confessionals are concerned. They could also acquire it in their travels or have some sort of deal with the bandits in the regions to allow them to persist in return for some of the captured people to be provided to the vampire via a proxy. These are just some ideas I had, I'm sure you could come up with more. With these basic beginner tips for writing the day-to-day -day of a vampire, I hope you can take some inspiration from these and build off of them in your games before you start planning on exactly what you want to do with them. After all, vampires are creatures defined by their character more than anything else, and it goes a long way to think about how these characters would realistically find a way to persist in a fantasy setting like D&D. Speaking of characters in the setting of D&D, I don't think I can escape from a vampires video without covering the D&D poster child of vampires, Count Strahd von Sadovich. He's Forgotten Realms Dracula, although he's kind of a bitch for being Dracula, but hey, we could change that if we want to. Strahd is an interesting character, albeit a ham-fisted attempt at writing a vampire in my opinion, and he's basically been there from the beginning. The lore suggests that he was one of the victims of the Dark Powers, a rather mysterious MacGuffin used to justify the demiplanes of dread that seemed to be even a mystery to the gods themselves. Perhaps we'll do a lecture on these entities at some point in the future. Regardless, he was collected by these powers after a series of unlucky events, and he was made the evil overlord of a fucked up reflection of Barovia, his fief before his fall. And the evil demiplanes of dread is where this took place. Forced to rule over this place as a depressed edgelord for eternity until the Dark Powers decided he's not a fun plaything anymore, which, as long as he keeps making money for Wizards of the Coast, is never. Well, I could go into more detail, I have a ton of shit to cover since this video is on vampires, so I don't want this video to be the length of a small novel. However, if you are interested more about the history of Strahd, he has a long and rich history in the game, and you can find little snippets on him going all the way back to the beginning when they made his Ravenloft module back in the day. Anyhow. Let's move on, shall we? Now that we've gotten some of the window dressing out of the way, let's get into a little more detail about vampires and my personal opinions on running them. First, let's take a look at the stat block as presented in the base game, and afterwards I can give a little input on what I think should be changed. So the base game vampire comes in with a natural AC of 16 and 144 hit points if you take average rolls, and it comes in at a medium size. They have a movement speed of 30 feet, which includes their spider climb ability, which is something we'll touch on in a second. For their ability scores, they sport a great strength score of 18, a great dex of 18, along with a constitution score of 18. They sport an impressive intelligence of 17, a good wisdom of 15, and a great charisma score coming in at 18. For saving throws, Playboy Cardi gets proficiency in the following saves. Dex coming in at a plus 9, wisdom coming in at a plus 7, and charisma coming in at a plus 9. For skills, our favorite mumble rapper comes in hot with proficiency in perception at plus 7 and stealth at plus 9. In the base game stat block, our sentient vacuum cleaner will get resistance to necrotic and non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. This, however, is bullshit, and I will be changing this later. For senses, blood gets dark vision out to 120 feet with a passive perception of 17. It knows all the languages it knew in life, and I would argue the languages it can pick up over time. Base game, it comes in at CR 13, which I think we'll try to keep to, as that would be accurate to the types of people we see besting them in the stories we read. Kind of like Bram Stoker's Dracula. Now let's get into the features. The first feature is Shape Changer. This explains that the vampire is able to change into a cloud of mist or a bat, as long as it isn't in sunlight or running water. The specifics of the rules are listed in the feature, but I don't feel like writing a whole novel for this section, so you can read the specifics for yourself if you don't already know them. The second feature is Legendary Resistance. This is just our vampire getting the three legendary resistances common with these types of creatures. The third is Misty Escape. This details how the vampire poofs into a giant fart cloud when it gets its ass kicked instead of falling unconscious like a normal person. When it hits zero hit points, it turns into a fart cloud and gets two hours to reach its resting place before it dies for good. It's immobile until it regains hit points, and after an hour of resting, it can come back. The rules for its mist form can be found in the Shape Changer feature. The fourth is Regeneration. Cardi gets to regain 20 hit points at the start of its turn, if it has at least one hit point and isn't in sunlight or running water. This is cancelled if it takes radiant damage or gets holy water thrown on it. The fifth feature is Spider Climb. It's basically Spider-Man shit. He can run on walls and ceilings and stuff like that. Kinda like Gareth the Goblin King. Six. This is called Vampire Weaknesses. I'm glad they kept the cool quirk of not being allowed in without being invited. It's harmed by running water, 
a stake to the heart paralyzes it, and it's hurt by sunlight. We'll talk about the changes I want to make later, but let's get into the actions and legendary actions first. For actions, Cardi gets a two-strike multi-attack while in its vampire form, only one of which can be a bite attack. For its first attack, our Soulless Abomination gets an unarmed strike that does a longsword's worth of damage, but it does it in bludgeoning damage. It can also choose to forgo this damage to grapple the target of the attack. It's a DC 18 check to escape. For its big attack, we get the infamous Bite. Like the rest of its attacks, this is a plus 9 to hit, and it does 1d6 plus 4 piercing damage, and also 3d6 necrotic damage. Note that the creature has to be grappled, willing, incapacitated, or otherwise restrained for Cardi to be able to bite them. The vampire regains hit points equal to the necrotic damage it does, as well as reducing the hit point maximum of its target. But I would note that I personally do not let them regain those hit points or reduce the max hit points if they do damage to undead or creatures like Warforged and other creatures of the like. If our Sanguine Addict gets a little too excited and sucks a little too hard, it kills the target, and they come back as a spawn if they're buried. Next, it has the ability to charm someone as an action. It can target a creature within 30 feet. The save DC is 17, and the target will likely be getting to repeat the save in combat situations quite often. This will be a key ability to keep in mind in both combat and role-playing situations that a vampire will be involved in. The effect only lasts for up to 24 hours, and the target has to be on the same plane of existence. It can be ended, but it has to be ended as a bonus action. Lastly, for our regular actions, the vampire gets a once-a-day ability to summon either 2d4 swarms of bats or rats or it can summon up to 3d6 wolves if it touches grass like the normies. This takes 1d4 rounds for the gang to pull up, and the crew sticks around for up to one hour, as long as the vampire doesn't get his ass kicked, or it tells them to fuck off. This will be useful for just giving our vampire some space if it's getting mobbed. Now let's look at the legendary actions. Our vampire gets three legendary actions each round, and it gets three different choices for those legendary actions. The first two are simple. They both cost one legendary action, one is moving, without provoking opportunity attacks, and the other is an unarmed strike. The third one, costing two legendary actions, allows it to make a bite attack. Pretty simple. Looking at all this, I think we have a good understanding of the basic stat block here, and with that, we can start building on it to make it a little more impressive and impactful. Firstly, I don't like how easy it is to kill vampires in this edition, so here are the changes I'm going to suggest making. I'm going to start by changing the rules to make it where they can only be killed by the following methods. Power word kill or some other similar spells that destroy or capture the soul. Cutting their head off and burning the body. Note that this has to be done with a weapon that can actually harm them. Or dragging them into the sun. Another thing I'm going to change is that I'm making them immune to all non-magical damage other than the running water damage, silvered weapons, or damage that they would take from holy water. I'm also going to make it where they instantly die if they end their turn in sunlight. And this does not include any spells that evoke or mimic sunlight. You've got to use the real sun. Other than that, I'm also going to set a rule defining that when vampires rest, it's not like they're actually sleeping. They're functionally a corpse until they rise again at nightfall. With that all being said, I think this covers most of the base game stat block changes that I'd look at making on any and all vampires that I would run. In making these changes, I think that we properly establish the vampire's quirks by amplifying both its weaknesses and its strengths. Now when players deal with them, it'll be more about figuring out how to kill it and where it rests during the day, and less about headbutting it until it stops moving. If you're wondering how this should end up looking in play, I would suggest taking a look at how things played out with the protagonist hunting down Dracula in Bram Stoker's Dracula, specifically the film. In the film, Van Helsing and the crew spend a ton of time in London trying to find all the different resting places that Dracula had set up around the city so that he couldn't have any places to rest during the day. Personally, to give this a little more kick, I would suggest making the vampire follow the same exhaustion rules as players for not resting to exhibit its need for rest during the daytime. I personally like this idea as it sounds infinitely more interesting than just having them figure out who Playboy Cardi is and then fight him. With that being said, I think this is a good segue into what it should look like running a vampire and how I think they should operate. Wherever a vampire is, its number one priority should be having multiple places set up throughout where it will be operating for it to rest. Traditionally, it needs either the coffin it was buried in or the dirt from its grave to make one of these spots. And while the book doesn't go into too much detail about this, your more religiously inclined party members should know how to purify the resting site in order to render it inoperable. Another thing to think about when deciding how our vampire will be making its moves is that we should have a somewhat coherent idea of what kind of influence it holds. Traditionally, the trope often has vampires being shoehorned into being lords of some sort of obscure or reclusive fiefdom. They're also usually best painted as absent, 
often having spread rumors that they have much business abroad and that they don't usually spend much time within the fiefdom they receive through whatever means you wish to give them. However, a vampire can lead a lot of different lifestyles, and you should definitely make sure to take this into consideration when you're writing them. A vampire that is an archmage is going to have a very different approach than a vampire that's a landed noble simply due to the lifestyle, so make sure to cover what you're writing with them. Regardless of their lifestyle, there's still going to be an overarching similarity as to how these little layers will be set up, simply due to the restrictions of how a vampire's physiology works. They will always need to make sure that their different resting places are located close enough to them to return to should they be felled. This means that even the wizards are usually going to need to be on the same plane of existence unless they go through a series of really stupid, not helpful, easily backfiring lengths to change this. These places may take many forms, such as estates, townhouses, fake burial sites, laboratories and libraries for mages, perhaps, and whatever else they may deem appropriate. The larger the area they're working with, and the larger their coin purse is, the more of these little places they are likely to have set up so that they can cover their asses while they're running around town being bad with the Grinch. Any experienced vampire hunters among your players will likely be privy to this sort of information, which will come in very useful for helping your players avoid the trial runs on trying to kick Cardi's ass for not releasing an album quick enough. Lore stipulates that the vampire must rest in either the coffin in which they were buried or the dirt of their grave. This implies that the amount of layers that they could set up would, in theory, be limited by the amount of grave dirt they have. As always, it's up to you how many of their little resting places they can actually have set up at a time, but I don't see them really being able to have more than 10 in most cases. However, they can still move this dirt and their coffins around to new places to suit their needs. This actually works out quite well because this further incentivizes the players to go after these locations. If you can purify the dirt, that takes it away from the vampire forever. This would mean that destroying these locations would actually be very costly to the vampire, and they could get themselves killed if they don't protect their resting sites accordingly. You know, now that I write this, vampires are actually sounding like they could possibly be one of the most fun creatures to go up against merely due to the ingrained cat and mouse game that arises naturally from the traits that they have. I may have to start writing one up soon after this. However, I think this is enough about setting up their resting spots. The only other logistical aspect I would have you think about is in terms of how they feed. This is going to be important because it will define the breadcrumbs you'll be leaving for your players, and it's the largest liability of the vampire. There's a lot of different ways that a vampire can use to try and satiate its needs, but regardless of what path it decides to take, it's going to need to leave evidence behind. Perhaps it's a simple nightcrawler that goes out and feeds on an unsuspecting and vulnerable person. The evidence left behind would be quite obvious in this case, unless the vampire intentionally dismembers or otherwise disposes of its victims accordingly. It could also dabble in humanoid trafficking of some kind, which would leave more of an organized trail, likely involving co-conspirators aiding the vampire that the party would be able to eventually trace back to our vampire. Perhaps it has a cult of people it feeds off even. Really, the limit is your imagination. With that out of the way, I think all we have left to talk about is the tactics. Now this is going to be a little different than the other monster tactics sections. This is because the vampire should play very differently based on the type of skills it possesses. Since there can be so many different ways to build these guys, I'm going to be a little general with the profiles. To keep it simple, I'm going to make a caster and a martial version for the vampire. For the caster, I'll be using Charisma as the spellcasting modifier, and I will be building our Bloodsucker loosely based off of a sorcerer. For the martial build, I will be building our vampire as a vicious fighter. Please note that I'll be pretty generic due to this being about vampires in general, but once you have more of an idea of what kind of person your vampire is, you can start giving it specific subclass features that suit its niche appropriately. But that's enough fucking around. Let's get into it. First, let's start with the martial version. The first thing I'll be doing is upping its hit points to 200. I don't know what the dice would be for this, but I don't care. You can do the math if you want. The base ability scores are all fine, so we don't need to change anything about that. I'm giving our martial vampire the following extra skills. Expertise in athletics, and proficiency in intimidation. I'll also give them history since they're old. I'm also upping its multi-attack to 3 since it's definitely above level 11. Also, action surge is a must. Now let's talk about gear. Many people like a vampire to have some sort of composure or grace that gives it some sort of subtle, menacing vibe. But I like to go full bore into the vicious beast in combat, and my choices in style will reflect that. For armor, I'm going to go with a plus two plate, setting our AC at a flat 20. I'm also going to give it a ring of protection, giving plus one to our saves and plus one to our AC, putting it at a 21. 
Keep in mind this is our first attunement slot. I'm also giving our vampire a plus two great axe with the properties of a sword of wounding from the DMG. This will be a plus two great axe that does a cool damage over time stack that it puts on your targets, but more importantly, any damage done with this weapon can only be healed via a short or a long rest. This is absolutely nasty and not something your players will be expecting. They'll start shitting themselves when the heals stop working. This is our second attunement slot. Keep in mind that this gives our Suck Lord a plus 11 to hit, which is much more respectable at the level it's supposed to be fighting at. For the last item, let's give it a Belt of Fire Giant Strength, bringing its Strength bonus to a plus 7. With this, our Vamp Lord's going to be rocking a lot more Bite at plus 14 to hit with a whopping plus 9 to damage on its weapon attacks. With this, we're starting to cook, and now this guy's starting to get a little scary if he gets a hold of you. With our Marshal's gear covered, let's talk about tactics. Our Marshal is still very intelligent with the base stats, so it's quite likely to be very pragmatic with its tactics. First, our Vampire is immune to non-magical, non-silvered damage, so it will likely try to size up the enemies it faces before a fight. If the Vampire gathers that its enemies aren't equipped to be able to hurt it, it's going to be much more prone to acting recklessly in combat. It's important to remember that the Vampire is smart, and will be able to put together roles, gear quality, and other details pretty easily. The Vampire will not be hesitant to fight another Marshal, as long as someone else isn't causing problems for them from the backline. Another feature that they are definitely going to leverage is their Spider Climb ability. They can use this to maneuver around inconvenient obstacles, be they players or terrain. The reason our Vampire isn't afraid to fight the Marshal is because the damage it deals with its weapon is not going to be able to be healed by magic or any other feature. Don't forget the Charm ability. It can use this to deal with annoying casters or anyone that's causing problems for it in general. If the vampire gathers that the people it's fighting actually pose a threat to it, it may likely err on the side of caution when it comes to dealing with them. I'm going to write our warrior vampire as an absolutely juiced, bloodthirsty, feral beast. Kind of like Conrad von Karstein from Warhammer for the initiated who may be familiar. So our vampire is going to be very aggressive and only retreat once it gathers that it's starting to lose. Keep in mind that our vampire can summon some allies too, but I'd also wager that the Vampire would likely have a decent sized cadre of Vampire Spawn Guards. Give them weapons and gear commensurate with the kind of vibe that our Vampire Warlord would be working with. Also, don't forget to use the legendary actions. Other than that, I think running the Martial Vampire is pretty simple. Get your big ass weapon out, and rip some mortals to shred. Now let's do the Spellcaster. First off, I'm mainly going to be ripping most of what comes from the Spellcaster variant you can find. The only thing I'm going to change is that I'm making it spellcasting modifier charisma instead of intelligence, and I'm giving it proficiency in history just like I did on the Marshal. The spells that the vampire is given, plus by choices, are the following. For cantrips, it gets Mage Hand, Prestidigitation, and Ray of Frost. For first level spells, it gets four slots, of which it can choose from, Comprehend Languages, Fog Cloud, and Sleep. For its second level spells, it gets three slots, and the spells it has are Detect Thoughts, Gust of Wind, and Mirror Image. For its third level spells, it gets three spell slots again. The spells it has are Animate Dead, Lightning Bolt, Bestow Curse, and Non-Detection. For fourth level, it gets three slots. For those two spells, it has Blight and Greater Invisibility. Lastly, it has one fifth level spell slot for which it can use Dominate Person. Now let's take a look at the items. First, let's lean into the whole not wearing armor thing and give our Grapefruit Enthusiast some Bracers of Defense. These will take up our first attunement slot, and will up our caster's AC to a crisp 18. Next, let's give it the Cloak of the Bat. This item's partially a meme, but it'll actually prove useful for our caster to kite the players, and it can use the flight to more easily reach ceilings and other hard-to-reach areas that it can cast spells from using its Spider Climb feature. This will be our second attunement slot. Lastly, I'm going to give our vampire a Wand of Web. This will use our last attunement slot, rounding off our magical equipment. Those are all the magical items, now let's talk about our tactics. The name of the game is Kiting, with the Spellcaster, and that's going to be borne out by the kit we've given it. The Vampire will be using its Cloak of the Bat to fly around to hard to reach places from which it can use Spider Climb to stick to and start blasting. Furthermore, the Web Wand will aid in this by allowing the Vampire to lock down the athletically challenged nerds of the party as well. This will make the goons that the Vampire comes rolling up with much more effective as well, since they'll have advantage on all their attacks against restrained creatures. This Vampire will approach combat in a cold and calculating way, preferring to pick the party apart rather than tearing them limb from limb like the Marshal. Its order of priority should be rather simple. 
Try to charm the marshals coming at you if they're getting uncomfortably close, and use ads for this if that doesn't work. As long as they aren't getting swamped, they're going to prioritize getting casters off the board, with an order of importance following something along the lines of clerics first, wizards and sorcerers second, rangers, then druids, then everyone else. And the reason I say rangers is simply because rangers will probably be shooting a magical bow at them. Do not forget the utility spells. It can throw out a dominate monster on a marshal going sicko mode. It is always going to be casting mirror image if it isn't up. And it can use greater invisibility to allow it to be even more annoying while it's hurling spells at our unfortunate players. The last thing to consider is that it's going to have goons just like the Marshall Vampire, and these will be more important for the caster than they will be for the Marshall. Use them to good effect to bog down Marshalls, or to gang up on people that failed their saves against the Web Wand. Then you'll be finding that they might even carry the fight. <sighs> well, that was a lot of writing. But with that, I think that covers most of what I would like to talk about during our initial, but hopefully informative, foray into vampires. As always, I would like to thank all of my co-conspirators and acolytes graciously furthering the cause of evil through their contributions to the Evil Defense Fund. You help make this work possible, and together we can work to make the world just a little bit worse for everyone in it. And to you all, thank you for attending this lecture. I hope you found the information held therein useful. Vampires are vindictive and scheming creatures, and any necromancer can expect to have at least a few of them as rivals along your journey to achieve your immortality. As usual, make sure to guard this information, as I do not wish for some of my more sanguine-inclined colleagues to gather that I've been meddling in their affairs. However, I believe it's time we brought things to a close for this lecture. So until next we meet, this has been your boy Archlich, and remember to never underestimate a vampire.